<laughs> okay, I put my glasses on. Hi, uh, fixing my hair. Okay, edit that part out. Uh, welcome to another video in the Nature of Code video series. And today, I don't have anything in my, I, I, I'm missing my pen. <laughs> Here it is, I have to hold it. I feel more comfortable this way. Today, we are making a huge leap forward. So if, if you actually watched every single video, or at least most of them up until now, you would have found that all of the simulations, there's a circle on the screen, a square on the screen, some shape on the screen. It's really an inanimate object. It has no decision-making ability. It has no life. It has no hopes and dreams and fears. It's just sitting there and forces in the environment push or pull it around. What we want to do in this very moment, in this very spot, together today is say, we want to begin to build simulations where the objects make a decision. I think earlier, in probably the first video, I think I might have talked about a, a ball sitting on a table that falls off the table versus a little creature sitting at the end of the table that chooses to jump off that table. Today we want to be that creature that jumps off the table, that, that is able to perceive its environment and make a decision as to where it should go. Now, we, have, we want to do this just for its own sake because this is going to be interesting and allow us to build um, different types of motion behaviors that we haven't been able to do so far. But we also have another goal in mind. So I want to um, come over here for a second and look. So this is um, without the mouse in the center. Oh, I, I don't, this does not control that mouse. This is this mouse. Anyway, that's irrelevant. What we have here is uh, an example that you'll find in processing. It's a flocking simulation. We're going to get to this example probably at the end of this set of chapter six videos. But the reason why I want to look at it is this is an example of a complex system. What is a complex system? Complex system is often thought of a system that's more than the sum of its parts. Well, what is the part here? The part is this little triangle that's moving around the screen that operates with these really three simple rules. Don't run into my neighbor, stay with the group, try to go in the direction of the group. Uh, we're going to look at those rules later more formally. But, but that simple, those simple rules, we can understand each one of these individual triangles very easily. But globally, then we get this kind of unpredictable, highly intelligent, ordered, yet chaotic um, behavior. It's really quite amazing. And, and uh, you know, there's tons of examples of this in nature. Ant colonies, termites, lightning, earthquakes, the weather. Uh, think about the stock market. There, we, we could go on and on and on and come, come up with tons of examples of systems of these simple agents that when you put them all together, you get this global intelligence. I mean, an ant can't be that sophisticated, but how does an ant colony build an elaborate set of tunnels and collect lots of food and, I don't know, protect the queen? Uh, disclaimer, I have no idea what ants actually do, but you know, it's something like that. I watched, I don't know, Bugs Life or B Movie or I don't know, there's a bunch of them. Anyway, so this is where we want to go. If we, but, but before we get to stuff like this, we're going to look at these simple agents. Now, um, so I, I'm going to get to all the details of this. I guess this video is kind of like a little bit of an introductory landscape of this topic. And I wanted to just point out to you um, a couple things that I think um, are useful for you to think about. So. Um, Okay, let's take a moment to define what we mean by autonomous agent. So what are the, what are the sort of principles that we're going to think about as we start to build these simulations that involve entities that, can, that, can, that are more alive? <laughs> okay, so one principle is that an autonomous agent has an ability, and there's a sort of key word here, a limited ability, to perceive its environment. Now this may seem like a trivial detail to you, but this will become quite an important factor in, in what we end up programming, right? Is, are the things on the screen able to see anything within um, 25 pixels of itself? Or perhaps, is this object on the screen only able to see things that are in front of it at a certain distance, right? So what is that limited ability? What can it actually see on the screen or smell or sense, right? We want to build, start building entities, these objects that have sensors on them, you know, virtual software sensors. So, okay, the other thing that we want to do is once it's perceiving its environment, it, it's going to kind of process that environment. So let's process the environment and calculate an action. So the key thing here is calculate that action. So I'm, a, I'm an entity and I'm, I'm I gotta get a better word than entity, but I'm a thing and I see that there's a bunch of things in front of me and those things look scary. So I'm gonna calculate my action which is to run away in the opposite direction. Right? And what is that calculation going to result in? It's going to result in a force. 
So what's really, um, what, what's really important about what we're doing here is we're not, we're not really doing anything new. We're just thinking about things differently and coming up with some interesting formulas and logic and rules by which we send forces into our objects. So even though we're thinking wildly different conceptually, this thing is alive, this thing is not alive, um, wind is something that just affects it, you know, external force like wind versus an internal force like fear, um, in the end, they're all just going to be forces. And um, the last thing I want to put on this list here is that, is that there is no global plan or leader. Now, this isn't some hard and fast rule, you know, from everything you ever build now in processing, you better not have a leader in that program. You know, we're not say, I'm not saying that by any stretch of the imagination. But one thing that's important to realize is um, we, as a kind of exercise here, are building entities that just respond to whatever they can perceive around themselves and, 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 and make a decision and, 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 and calculate an action based on that. There isn't some global leader telling them what to do. Now, you may want to build simulations with global plans and leaders in them, and that's fine, but a true autonomous agent wouldn't have that. It really is making its decisions only based on its own perception of the environment. So these are the kind of key principles that we're going to see in the programs we're going to build. Now, what are these examples we're going to make and where do they come from? So there's a lot of places, there's a lot of things we could come up with and think of. Um, ultimately, we're going to build our examples off of the work of uh, Craig Reynolds and his um, uh, uh, all based on this paper he wrote called Steering Behaviors for Autonomous Characters, um, which I'm going to get to in a second. But before we do that, let's just look um, at some kind of nice examples of this. So I, I, I have this video on a loop here, which I'm going to try to, have no idea where it's going to be in the video. But um, So this is from Casey Reese's Process Compendium, which I will link to below. And you can see here, there's an element with a bunch of rules. If you, I, I highly suggest you go and pause this video and go watch his video. And you can see, here are all of these elements that are operating with these very simple rules. They perceive their environment. What are they near? If they hit something, if, if they intersect something, turn. If they don't intersect something, something goes straight. And all of his work, these beautiful artworks, are created out of these incredibly simple rules. And I can kind of um, um, scan through this, and you can see I'm going to go back to the beginning, and we can see this maybe this, 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 this simulation is perhaps a slightly better um, representation of that. So one of the, the reasons why I wanted to just quickly reference um, uh, uh, Casey Reese's work is because a lot of his inspiration comes from, am I still here? Yes. <laughs> it comes from this book. I have a prop now. It's a book. It is paper. Ooh, it's like a fanning me. Okay. This book called Vehicles by um, Valentino Breitenberg. So um, Valentino Breitenberg is a neuroscientist. Uh, and I think if I go here, and this is just the page of the book on um, Google Books. And you can see that what, what's nice about this book is it's kind of exercise in science fiction in a way, and creating these ideas of these little robots with sensors that see light, and this one is afraid of the light, and this one is attracted to the light. And, um, and, and Bradenberg really thinks of um, these vehicles as almost like you know, pets or little creatures, and they respond to fear or love or aggression or foresight. And, and so I think this is an important place to really think about, a, a, a really nice set of inspiration for how you might want to think about and build autonomous characters. So I will also link to some material on Breitenberg's vehicles below, which you can look at as a kind of source of inspiration for you. But the reason why I bring this up is Breitenberg's vehicles were, were a main source of inspiration for Craig Reynolds' steering behaviors. So what we're ultimately going to look at um, and build a set of processing examples which are just pure implementations of Reynolds' steering behaviors for autonomous characters. So this is a paper that was uh, written in 99. Um, I, I encourage you to take a look at it. I'm going to kind of go through a lot of it in uh, less formal, less depth processing speak, and so you might want the kind of true uh, guts of this by taking a look through this paper yourself. But what Reynolds has done is has said, okay, we don't really care exactly about how things really truly work in the real world. What we want to create is the appearance. We want to create lifelike and improvisational characters that move about the screen. And I, one of my favorite examples, there's a whole set of behaviors, wandering and seeking, pursuing a target, uh, following a path. One of the ones that I think is a great illustration of this is queuing at a doorway. And we can see here in this um, simulation we have a lot of elements that are all trying to get 
get through this doorway, but as they come together, they have to slow down and stop. So how, what is its perception of this environment? How does it know where the door is? How is it trying to get there? How does it see the things around it? Why does it choose to slow down when it gets near something? These are all the types of things that we want to step through. So we're going to look at the, um, this idea of a steering force, how do we calculate a steering force and what are a lot of scenarios whereby we need these steering forces? What kind of steering force do we want when an object wants to catch some, you know, catch its prey um, versus escape from a crowded room because it feels very claustrophobic in that room? Strange scenario. There's a great, I, I should link to it below, there's a great um, uh, paper and sim uh, online simulation that came out recently of simulating a mosh pit. Um, so what is, what is a mosher in a mosh pit desire to do and what types of decisions does it make based on how other moshers are moshing around them, right? You could ask yourself that question, you could come up with a set of rules and then you could simulate that and I encourage you to take a look at that simulation which I will link to below. I don't have it prepared here because I don't prepare for any of this. <laughs> Just blabbing on and on. I will get better at this, I swear. Okay, so um, let's talk, so we, we're, this is just a lot of flowery language and kind of walking through a bunch of things here, which, which I'm almost done with, but what I wanna do is kind of talk through how Reynolds thinks of um, um, what his vehicles do. So Reynolds thinks of his vehicles as operating with three steps. Action, selection, steering, and locomotion. So our objects that we're going to build in processing are going to follow these three steps. Action selection is looking at the environment and choosing an action. Oh, I've got to get that food. Oh, I've got to run away from that predator. Oh, I really want to get through that doorway. Oh, that path looks lovely. It's the yellow brick road. Let me follow it, right? So we have to choose a desire. And here, this word desire is really, really key. All of our objects that we're going to build are going to have a desired velocity. The velocity, the direction and speed at which they really want to go at the moment. Once they have that desired velocity, we're going to calculate a steering force based on it. That steering force want to write the word, is a force. It's just a vector. So just the way we calculate an attraction force, we calculated a friction force. We are now calculating steering forces. And we're going to have a very specific formula for it, which is so simple and elegant and po but powerful. And that's really the innovation that, that Reynolds came up with with this framework. So we're going to look at how we calculate steering forces. And the good news here, once we have that steering force, we need to apply it to the object's locomotion. It needs to move. What are some options for locomotion? Well, we could have Euler integration, location, velocity, and acceleration. We could use box 2D. We could use toxic libs, right? The third step is the physics simulation. So all we're doing here is we're saying we have an existing physics simulation, and now we're going to layer on top of it this methodology for choosing behaviors and applying forces to those objects. So, th this, so everything that we've done all videos long <laughs> is all building up to this point where we now have this physics engine. We could use any one of these. We're going to use our own. We're just going to use p-vector and our own location, velocity, and acceleration, and now starting to apply steering forces to it. So um, I'm going to stop this video here. That's kind of an introduction to the landscape of all of this stuff. I think I have this list of things that I covered. And in the next video, we're going to all we're going to really look at is this very simple calculation for how we calculate a steering force. And the first behavior that we're going to look at is seeking a target. So like, ah, over there is something I want to get there. I'm going to, how do I steer in that direction? Which is very similar to gravitational attraction, but I want to look also at like how this model differs from that and how it's in many ways more powerful or at least a better model for entities that might be alive or kind of providing their own set of um, uh, uh, moving themselves about a space as opposed to just experiencing a force. Okay, um, <laughs> thank you and uh, I'm just going to say good night, but it's the afternoon. Uh, I'm over here now. Okay, goodbye. <laughs>